Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Jay Griffin, the chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. I'm joined by my colleagues, Commissioner Jennifer Potter, uh, Commissioner Leo Suntian, as well as Commission staff and the Consumer Advocates Office. The uh, purpose of our conference today is to address Hawaiian Electric's plans in anticipation of the retirement of the AES Hawaii Power Plant on Oahu in December 2022. Some quick remarks on the format, and then we'll go right into the presentations. We have a lot of material, so we want to get started on that right away. Uh, but before we start, I want to briefly discuss a few things. The Commission's hosting the status conference through WebEx for the docket parties, but is live streaming this uh, for the public and stakeholders via YouTube link provided in docket number 2017-0352 and on the Commission's website. Uh, you will not be able to provide comments uh, through that link but you can always submit them into the docket um, for further questions later. Commission's recording the status conference and the recording will, will continue to be available on the commission's YouTube channel. For the status conference agenda fi filed in the docket earlier this week, we will begin with HNEI's presentation regarding the potential for renewable energy resources and demand response to meet Oahu grid reliability and stability needs. And then we'll follow that directly afterwards with Hawaiian Electric's presentation in response to the commission questions that were filed in the docket on December 10th uh, regarding its plans in anticipation of the AES uh, plant retirement. And then we'll, from there, we'll move on to questions from Consumer Advocates Office, Commission staff, and then Commissioner questions. With that, uh, we're going to turn it, HNEI will be up first, and then Juan Electric, and we'll turn it over to I believe Derek, you'll be presenting. If you could please introduce yourself uh, for the primarily for the external audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, while I pull that up, if Rick, I don't know if you want to give an intro quickly to this project overall, but let me get this screen share going and then I can get an intro. I will come off of you and, and, and keep this extremely short. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration with HNEI working with Telos Energy as shown on this slide. And the funding to support this program came from a combination of the Energy Systems Development Fund, which is funded through the barrel tax, as it's more commonly known, but also cost shared uh, with the Office of Naval Research Funding. And with that, I, I think we should we can get right to the discussion and, and turn it back to Derek. Thanks, Derek. All right. Thanks, Rick. And can everyone see my screen? All right. So thank you, Rick. And thank you, everyone, for having me. My name is Derek Stenslick uh, with Telos Energy. I've, I know several of the folks kind of on the WebEx here and, and probably several of the folks tuning in to the YouTube. I've been working with h and &E and in Hawaii for kind of approximately eight years now doing power system planning of some form of another. So um, thanks again for having me. We'll go through some of the work that we've been doing recently uh, kind of in collaboration with h and &E and then available for any, any questions or follow up as needed. So I want to start out with the objectives of this. Uh, you know, as you all know, the reason we're here today is to look at um, the reliability with the retirement of AES. But what I want to also focus and, and talk about today with everyone is the tools and methodology that we use to evaluate operation and reliability really of the grid with large amounts of variable solar and energy limited storage. So while the focus of today is on the AES retirement and maintaining reliability, we want to also spend some time on the, the tools that we use to do that, because with that changing resource mix, we see a change in the way uh, we need to approach that from a modeling perspective or a quantification perspective. So we use those tools and those models to look at grid reliability when AES is replaced with utility scale solar and storage and standalone storage and specifically looking around uncertainty of annual solar variability and unit outage rates. Uh, and then we'll conclude the presentation with um, potential reliability risks, but also more importantly, what could be mitigation strategies during that transition from the AES coal plant retirement to a system that is has significant amounts of solar and storage resources uh, that's likely to take place over the next few years. So, yeah. yep. Uh, given that I'm starting off, I just wanted to frame uh, everybody tuning in. Likely, you know, everybody uh, tuning in is, is at least uh, at least aware of some of these changes that are taking place. 
And really the focus here is the next two to three years. So in the 2022, 2023 timeframe is when uh, there's uh, significant changes going on in the Oahu grid. So the uh, first and foremost, the AES retirement uh, scheduled for September 2022 uh, and being triggered first and foremost by the PPA expiration of the plant, but also very important to note legislated now legislatively mandated that there's a, a ban on all coal fired generation after that date. Uh, it's, it's notable 180 megawatts is uh hiko's largest single generator so it's one of the largest uh, power plants in hawaii uh, so it, so it is a big a significant change in the overall resource mix uh, and and the resources slotted to replace that a combination of standalone storage and uh solar plus storage and so walking through some of those project proposals uh scheduled to be in service uh, by july 2022 is a proposed project a 185 megawatt 565 megawatt hour standalone battery at capillet uh this was awarded in hico stage 2 rfp uh, but is awaiting regulatory approval with the commission as, as far as i know uh that is a standalone storage project everything else i'll talk about on this slide is uh a solar plus storage project and we'll talk a little bit about the nuances of that as we go through the presentation but there's a stage one project which is uh projects four projects currently under development these have regulatory approval have ppas in place um, a total of about four, 140 megawatts of solar plus storage uh and, and there have been some recent delays announced so uh, somewhat of note if we start talking about this transition plan and then immediately um, kind of after those projects were awarded, um, another set of proposed projects, uh, this time on Oahu, six solar plus storage projects totaling 274 megawatts. So just want to lay the stage. I know a lot of folks probably are, are well aware of that. And, and I'm sure the HECO uh, team can sh update anything I may have missed in terms of the actual status of these projects. But what's really a more note here is if you look at a timeline of and this is Oahu's RPS by year, uh, you see there's a, a fundamental shift in, in the grid that's happening over these two years. And so it's going from you know, today, the recent past 25 to 30 percent RPS and really jumping in a matter of a couple of years to 50 percent RPS. And that's annual percentage of sales. But as we know, uh, when you get into power system planning, there can be times that this number will be much, much higher on an instantaneous basis. So really, you know, just wanted to reiterate that this is a fundamental shift in the way uh, HECO's grids are going to be operated. And the resource mix is, mix is going to look very different. And so that because of that, um, and specifically because of that increase in uh, solar and utility scale solar and storage, it, it brings about new uh new ways to think about modeling risk and uncertainty with those resources so quickly i'll go over this chart this was mainly filed uh ahead of time so people could have time to review it but just wanted to go over the there's really the way i look at it four buckets of power system planning four different types of tools starts out with ca capacity planning this is for optimizing long-term selection of resources out into the future, IRP type planning, kind of which resources should be built. Uh, and there's production cost analysis, which looks at operating the grid very much, uh, very similar to the way the HECO operators will just commit and dispatch their units on a day-to-day -day basis. So it looks at hourly or sub-hourly commitment and dispatch and the way the grid is operated across the day. Uh, and then there's resource adequacy analysis. And so this looks at um, probability of resources being unavailable during uh, you know, peak load events and what the risk is to, of not having enough resources available at any time to, to serve load. And so the focus of today will really be on resource adequacy analysis, but I'll talk a little bit of how we um, with the work we're doing with h and i have really combined the production cost analysis with the resource adequacy analysis to evaluate risk. Uh, and then lastly, the stability analysis. This looks at really short-term response after disturbance. Won't be the focus of today's presentation, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but as with any tools out there, there, there's limitations. And specifically, as we move to a resource mix that 
has a significant increase in solar and solar plus storage. Uh, you know, the way these models are used and implemented may have to change. And really what I want to focus on uh, right now is resource adequacy analysis. So again, this is looking at, is there enough resources available to the system operator to meet load under uncertainty? And so uncertainty can come from a few things. It can come from load that, that fluctuates uh, on, with some uncertainty. Generator outages, which can be either forced outages that the operator does not know about. It's, it's an immediate failure, or it can be maintenance outages that have to occur. And then there's also weather variability, and this is getting to be obviously much more important as a grid's resource mix changes. And so really making sure that given all the potential variability in the weather, looking across many, many years of weather data, can we be certain that there is enough solar resource on the system? And, and as the storage increases as well, and because of some of the charging constraints on this, the storage, making sure the storage resources will also be available given the fluctuation and the variability of the solar resource. So again, that type of analysis, looking at a probabilistic assessment um, of risk. But typically you look at kind of legacy resource adequacy analysis really across the industry. And one of the limitations that there's been in the past is it typically or, or does, didn't always look at every hour of the year. Um, oftentimes in the past, it was really peak load periods that were the most critical. And so a lot of the analysis just looked probabilistically around large generator outages, fossil outages um, on the peak load conditions and what the probability was of not having enough capacity to serve load. And what we're seeing now in the industry uh, is because of this shift to solar storage and, and, and other variable resources, really every hour of the year matters for this type of analysis. And specifically, chronologically stepping through the way the grid is operated becomes very important because the storage and demand response resources, those are energy limited resources. And so the availability of those resources for any given hour really depends on what occurred in the hours before and what is likely to happen in the hours after. Whereas, you know, historically, that was not as big of a challenge. And so this work, what, what we're trying to do here is kind of combine the disciplines of production cost analysis and resource adequacy analysis to look at uh, what's called sequential Monte Carlo simulation. So really doing probabilistic draws around the way the grid is operated under a lot of uncertainty in the solar resource and the, all the other generators that can go on outage. And so this is just a diagram of this integrated modeling process. Again, the focus of today's presentation is going to be the stochastic resource adequacy analysis, but I wanted to frame this across all of the tools that we've developed to really look at this type of grid planning for, for really an evolving resource mix. So it starts out, what I'll note here is two things off to the left as inputs into this model. Multiple years of solar data. This was um, really one of the first that we've spent a lot of time on this with the work with HNEI. We pulled in 21 years of historical so, uh, modeled solar data to really understand what are the, what's the probability of uh, long duration solar uh, low solar periods and what what's the risk to the system as it evolves with with those weather patterns. The other one is historical outage data. So looking at how HECO's units um, have gone on outage in the past and see if there is a way we can introduce that uncertainty into these models uh, so that we can better project the future. So that process starts out with the stochastic resource adequacy analysis, really looking at testing for reliability. And so I put some metrics here. Uh, you, some may be accustomed to them from the industry, but loss of load expectation, loss of load hours and expected unserved energy. We'll be talking about those in particular today. Um, and really, if you think about this from the grid services perspective uh, that HECO and, and the commission have been working on over the past few years and the, uh, the IGP, this is really looking at that capacity grid service or in, in the latest IGP iteration, the ERM, energy reserve margin, has a, has a piece in this. So this is the grid service we're looking at there. Um, but importantly, we can then take that those stochastic uh, analysis over many, many years of uh, operation and 
potential outages and flow that through a full suite of models to get into the real uh, detailed commitment and dispatch. So looking at sub hourly uh, operation of the grid, and then finally into dynamic uh, grid stability and looking at what happens to the grid immediately after a contingency event like a generator trip or a line outage. And what we've tried to do by tightly coupling these is to look at all of this more stochastically and, and more uh, with a lot more randomness introduced. Um, and then, you know, the reason we're doing that, we can look at reliability, test for any scenario we want to look at in the future, um, start evaluating some of these grid services, and then doing what we're doing today, kind of sharing this for uh, with the stakeholders and, and giving information that can then be evaluated. So talked a little bit about the weather variability going into this. So what we what we introduced for this project is looked across 21 years of historical solar irradiance data. And so we use the NRL National Solar Radiation Database, it goes back 21 years. And this is specific to the, or the data we pulled for this is specific to Hawaii. So we looked at each existing solar plant and developed a custom profile across 21 years of historical weather and then all of the proposed uh, stage one and stage two projects, we developed a custom profile for those. And then for the distributed PV, we aggregated across 14 sites across Oahu, and we uh, did a kind of a population load rating for that. And so what this gives us is not just a single year of solar resource that we, we use in our planning models now, it's looking at this across a much wider range of potential outcomes. And so the chart on the left here is showing the range of monthly generation. Um, and you can see there's a clear seasonality to that that's true across all of the weather years, but then there's a, a, a wide range of the minimum and maximum uh, either capacity or, or energy, depending on how you look at it. Um, and specifically, you know, what, what becomes interesting is this wide range in the winter months. And, and anecdotally, I know a lot of folks listening may remember, uh, I, I certainly wasn't there, but the 2006, what we call the 40 days of rain event and where this was a, a prolonged period of low solar uh, or low uh, significant cloud coverage and rain that could impact solar generation so what's important is we're not going back and modeling the grid the way it was in 2006 because there's very little solar on it but we're using those weather patterns and assuming what if that were to occur again and so we start to see uh you know the potential for these long duration low solar events come into play and we wanted to look at that not just what happens if we look at that case in particular but look at it more probabilistically and how likely are those to occur across 21 years um, and the chart on the right it's just a different way of looking at this this is a rolling seven day average um, relative to so the black line is the 21 year rolling seven day average um, which again the clear seasonal pattern the blue line is the 2006 rolling average. And so again, you have this long period of low solar output um, and specifically, uh, you know, one event here of many days in a row, well below the average. And so we wanted to look at events like that. Um, and again, look at it more probabilistically across many years. The other big input I, I highlighted there is the outage rates of the generators. And so specifically there's three outage rates uh, that we want to look at from a reliability perspective. Because again, the, the purpose of this work is to show, I'm oh, sorry, this didn't flip, there we go. Uh, the purpose of this work is to show what happens or what the probability is that there's insufficient resources available to serve load. So one aspect of that is the underlying solar resource. The other aspect of that is generators are not always available. They do go on outage. There's three different types um, that we've categorized here planned outages, which these are scheduled years or months in advance. So this is major unit overhauls. The, uh, the, the power plants, the units will come down for several weeks at a time in order to do a, a planned maintenance event that's known well in advance. A second bucket of uh, outages is maintenance outages. So these are, um, a unit can be brought down on maintenance with a little bit of flexibility in when you take that unit down on maintenance, but uh, it's not quite to the level that's planned here uh, on these really long overhauls. So these may be shorter maintenance events. There's a little bit of flexibility on when they happen, but they're not 
planned in the same sense as, as these ones down here. And then there's four outages. And, and these are ones that Tico or the system operator doesn't have any foresight into. This is a, a generator has a failure, has to be brought down immediately for service. And then depending on how severe it is, bring it back in. And so this here, uh, what we're showing on this chart is the uh, historical trend in outage rates. You will see for the for the HECO units, there is something notable that happened. If you look at um, the forced outages and the maintenance outages uh, over the last 12 years, there was really a step change in this 20 going from 2014 to 2015. Um, and likely a significant portion of that is due to the EPA mercury air toxic standards. So new rules coming in to how uh, emissions requirements for the steam oil units and specifically around when those units have to be washed and um, in order to comply with those requirements. And so because there is additional maintenance uh, that tightens kind of when the maintenance for everything else has to occur. And you do have some, you know, these, these steam oil units are aging so that so that could be a contribute, contributing factor as well. But we looked at this historically to say, you know, you could use a long term average, but because there was a fundamental shift in this new uh, environmental regulation, we chose to use a five year average outage rate for the analysis um, from 2015 to 2019. So basically the average here and we are assuming then we pull generator outages randomly based on that average outage rate. And I'll get into the details of that on the next slide. So what are we doing this resource adequacy analysis? So this is, again, I'll, uh, I said this before, but it's a stochastic analysis. So we're introducing a lot of random variability into the models where historically, most of the work we did looked at a single weather year, a single outage year, and we, we looked at how the system uh, operated with different resource mixes. What we're doing here is a similar process to that, but now introducing uh, 21 years of solar data um, that I talked about. And then we're looking at, we're for each of those 21 years, pulling, sampling those across 12 different random outage draws. So the model will randomly select when those outages occur. And we'll do that 12 times for each of the 21 years of solar data. So you get a total of 252 Monte Carlo samples. And so that's what this matrix is showing here. Uh, and you have the, on the y-axis of this matrix, you have the different solar years going from 1998 to 2018. On the x-axis, outage draws. So we took the weather year from 1998, applied it to the current grid configuration and the, the future proposals. And then we ran that across 12 randomly selected out of draws. And then we repeated that for each weather year. And so you get 252 unique cases. And I've summarized here, the numbers in this represents the number of hours in that year where there is insufficient resources to meet load. And so this is a pretty severe year where there are 10 hours across the entire year uh, where you, there were insufficient resources to meet load. Other ones, you know, maybe one or two hours, but the, actually the majority of them have zero outages. There's always sufficient resources. And what we do is take an average of all of those outages uh, or those capacity shortfalls events. And we say, and that becomes a resource adequacy metric that we track across all the different portfolios we look at. Another thing to note is each of these cells actually represents a full year of modeled operation. So 8,760 hours in each of these cells. So when you multiply that out by the matrix, we're looking at 2.2 million hours of operation here with a lot of random variability. And then that gets repeated for multiple portfolios where we look at what is what does system reliability look like under today's system? What does it look like when AES is retired? And then what does it look like as we add more solar and storage resources? And what this specifically, the reason we use this approach is because it takes into account a few key aspects. Um, one is chronological dispatch of the battery systems and the demand response, because those are energy limited. They're not always going to be available. They have restrictions on the duration that they can be used. Second is interannual variability. Um, Certainly uh, very important here. 
uncertainty and timing of generator outages. And then we can use that to get very detailed characteristics of these capacity shortfall events. So rather than just looking at how many times did that occur, we can look into metrics like what did these capacity shortfall events look like? So again, uh, this is you know an important matrix to put in the back of your head for the next few slides, because what we're gonna what I'm gonna do next is take all of these cases and collapse it down to a single average value, right? For for all of those cases, we're gonna track the averages across that. And so, and then we then I I'm presenting here a curve that shows the average values from that type of simulation across seven different cases. So now we're looking at seven cases. Each of those cases have been evaluated 252 times with different amounts of solar variability and different amounts of generator outages. And so on the Y axis here, this is, it's been normalized here to the current system, but it's your overall level of system risks. So the higher the number, the higher the risk of a capacity shortfall event. Again, what we're doing is counting the times that there's insufficient capacity to serve load. And we've normalized it here on this, this axis so that one represents the current system. And so any increase is a multiple on the likelihood of there not being enough capacity to serve load. So again, uh, this dot in the lower left-hand quadrant represents uh, the current grid as it is today with all the different resources on it. Then moving up this, uh, you get to a point that represents the current resource mix with the AES retirement, but nothing replacing it. So no replacement at all. Um, obviously, uh, this is a, a much larger increase in system risk and a 17 times larger, higher probability of not having enough resources to serve load. Then what we did is on the x-axis here, looked at that same analysis, but now introducing different amounts of solar plus storage resources. And again, these solar plus storage resources we uh, are the ones being proposed in the stage one and stage two RFPs or have been awarded and are under construction. So 140 megawatts, this dot represents the full build out of the stage one solar and storage projects. Uh, and then the dot over here represents both a full build out of stage one and stage two. But importantly, we wanted to look at intermediate points there as well. So what happens if only parts of those projects are built? And specifically when we start talking about timing in the next few slides, some of these intermediate points might be more important. So uh, what we'll look at, I'll, I'll use the same chart again and flip. Oh. Okay, well, hold on one second. I'll. I'll uh, take two takeaways from this slide. Uh, one is the solar plus storage resources can be a very effective uh, resource to provide capacity and reliability benefits. And so that right there is an important takeaway um, that even after taking into account solar variability, solar uncertainty, and taking into account the charging restrictions on the battery. So we're, we're assuming here uh, especially for the stage one projects, we're assuming that they can only be charged by the solar uh, resource. They can't be charged by the grid. So they're very weather dependent. And then when we get out to the stage two projects, there's a little bit more flexibility there. They're in the contracts, there is some ability to charge from the grid at, at certain periods. So that's an important takeaway that um, it is a significant, uh, significantly valuable for providing reliability services. The second takeaway is where this inflection point or this uh, cross point occurs. So this intersection represents where the amount of solar plus storage resources that would be required to bring the system back to current levels of reliability after the AES retirement. So it's somewhere in the range of 160 to 170 megawatts of solar plus storage restores reliability to current levels um, after the AES retirement. That's also notable. So AES is 180 megawatt coal plant, and yet we're saying it only needs 160 to 170 megawatts to bring you back to that current level. And the reason for that is AES goes on outage at times, right? And so when you lose AES unexpectedly, that 
represents 180 megawatt loss of capacity. Um, one of the benefits of the solar plus storage systems, these are much more modular systems. So the likelihood of losing an entire plant is significantly reduced because the, the modularity of the inverters and solar panels um, are important. And then also it's, it's many, many separate, um, you know, you have four separate projects here, I believe another nine separate projects in stage two. So many plants scatter across the island. So you get some diversity benefits and the risk of having an outage in the plant. So now what, we'll, what I'll show in the next slide is the same chart. Um, so this blue line is exactly the same. What I've done is zoomed in on the Y axis because it's this, this period, the, this level of risk is what we want to focus on um, and get a little bit more detailed on. And we've, I've also shown here what that looks like if you also add the proposed 135 megawatt standalone storage project at Capital A. So again, this dot represents with AES retired and that solar uh, and the standalone project goes in without any additional solar plus storage. So a significant improvement. Remember, if I go back one slide, this is AES retired without any replacement. If we add the standalone storage and nothing else brings us back pretty close to where uh, the system is today, even if none of the solar plus storage projects go forward. And then again, we, we draw the same line again saying if you have that 135 megawatt standalone storage project and get more solar and storage from the stage one and stage two RFPs, what does that look like um, in terms of reliability? So again, significantly improved over the current system. And so both of these lines are showing that whether it's standalone storage or it's solar plus storage, both resources are very effective at re uh, improving reliability and reducing the likelihood of a, a capacity shortfall event. But it also introduces an element of timing. And so basically by September 2022, based on announced delays and kind of project schedules, and I believe Hiko is going to go into more detail on those uh, following this presentation, but it's likely that the, the grid will end up somewhere in this range of solar plus storage projects, as long as those projects go uh, continue to progress on time. And so you can look at it if the standalone storage battery does not go in, you end up kind of somewhere on this line with just under 100 megawatts, 80, 90 megawatts of solar plus storage. Um, you had about three and a half to four times increased risk um, if that's the only replacement resource. Then again, if you look at that same point, you bring it down to 80 to 90 megawatts of solar plus storage um, from the stage two, pro stage one projects. Well, what does that look like with the capital A standalone storage? Again, significant improvement relative to where you are today. So really what this line, what these lines are, are meant to show is you could also view this as not just incremental additions of solar plus storage, um, but also timing, right? So the amount of time it takes to bring some of those solar plus storage projects on will dictate where um, you are on either of these lines. And it also kind of shows um, the value of the standalone storage. Uh, if you can't get a full build out or in the meantime of getting the full build out of the solar and storage resources. Again, what we want to show here, this dash blue line, that's the current level of reliability uh, of the current grid. And then what we're trying to see is when we get back to that point or improvement. Again, you can do that with either just the state, uh, solar plus storage resources, but there's a timing issue. We'll think when AES actually retires, will be somewhere around this point in the curve. Um, but if, if timing was not an issue, you could end up driving down here to, to improve reliability even without the standalone storage. The standalone storage, certainly uh, a big improvement would, would also get you well below the current, when I say below the current level um, in terms of outage risk. So that's a, a significant improvement relative to today. The other thing I'll note is this is looking at the system just with the AES retirement. And so if you go to a subsequent retirement after that, um, you know, obviously when you're either at this point with stage two fully deployed, there's there's no reliability risk. And even at some of these points, significantly reduced reliability risk. So opportunity uh, potentially for additional fossil retirements as well when you get to any of these points. 
And then lastly, wanted to look at uh, demand response resources as well. So we looked at um, 60 megawatt, two hour demand response. So this is a resource you could reduce load by uh, two hours a day. And the way we look at this from a 60 megawatt, two hour resource, because this is distributed across many, many different uh, loads, we're looking at this as 120 megawatt hours in one day that can be reduced. And so you could spread that out over four hours or you could collapse it um, to just two. And, and so there's some flexibility in how that demand response gets used, but overall it's 120 megawatt resource with a max capability of 60 megawatts. And then we put limitations in there on how many times per year it can be called. Um, but interestingly that even a, a very short duration demand response that can only be called a few times a year, has significant value as well. Um, you know, with increased solar plus storage can also get you back to this, uh, current system levels. And another important thing, it's a little bit hard. You can spend some time looking at the different lines later, but uh, an important takeaway here is at current levels of penetration and with the first major uh, fossil retirement, solar plus storage, demand response, and standalone storage all have similar uh capacity value or similar ability to uh provide reliability after a fossil retirement so that's an important takeaway it won't necessarily be true for future uh retirements that there will be saturation effects for all of these resource resources but important to point out for these early fossil retirements they're very effective resources So I'll summarize uh, with, with a couple different summaries here. First, key findings, and then into some, uh, some plans about the, the period of transition that the grid's going through. So first, the, the key findings, solar plus storage can replace AES without a loss of grid reliability, but a return to current reliability levels requires 160 to 170 megawatts of solar plus storage. So that's equivalent to a full deployment of the stage one projects and approximately 10% of the stage two projects. So certainly a timing concern with the solar plus storage uh, alone, because not even all of stage one is scheduled to be in place before AES retires. So a timing risk there, but important to note that those resources are effective at providing reliability. Second key finding, standalone the standalone 135 megawatt battery um, even with modest solar plus storage deployment could provide the required reliability for the AS re retirement. So, so um, even with the timing risk, as long as that 135 megawatt battery is in place, we can get back to current levels of reliability. Uh, based on projected timelines for stage one, uh, sufficient solar plus storage to provide that full replacement will not likely be in place at the time of the AS retirement, uh, making the timing of that standalone storage critical. Uh, and fourth, the reliability value of solar plus storage, standalone storage, flexible DR, I just spoke about this, but those are effectively equivalent today, but um, that, again, that efficacy will saturate at higher levels. And then increase, lastly, you know, going back a few slides, we showed an increased trend in outage rates because of some of the environmental compliance and the aging of the, the steam oil fleet. Increases in outage rates of the remaining thermal units could introduce additional risks to the grid, um, certainly continued assessment of, of those outage rates is, is warranted. And last slide, really showing this as managing the transition. So if there's a risk of delay in stage one installations or uh, the delay in commissioning the 135 megawatt battery, uh, you know, it's our view that that warrants uh, a contingency plan. So again, I think if the, these resources, we show a very clear path to actually improving reliability as these projects go in, it really comes down to timing, right? Because the AES retirement, again, that is set in, you know, largely in stone in September, 2022, legislatively mandated. Um, and so what Derek, are the options? Yep. Derek, your slide did not change. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, I'm having a little trouble there. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that, Rick. So again, uh, so what are the options if that's to occur? Uh, one is to retain or develop the option for increased thermal generation capacity. And again, one thing I'll say about this slide, we're not trying to advocate for any of these options, really just putting the options on the table, um, not necessarily ranking these in any order. So one of those options is explore options for temporary generators. So certainly there is um, truck mounted, 
gas turbines, uh, temporary diesel gensets that could be brought in for a very short period of time uh, to shore up from a reliability perspective if it's deemed necessary. Um, certainly, a temporary extension of the AES coal plant operation uh, would help in a transition period if, if necessary. But again, uh, there's likely significant legislative and contractual challenges to that, um, several others. Uh, second, explore adjustments to maintenance schedules to minimize maintenance during the transition. I believe that's something uh, Hiko will touch on in the next presentation. But like we showed is one of the biggest drivers. It was actually not weather related, uh, solar related uh, resource reductions, but actually just the number and amount of generator outages. So to the extent that some of those, especially those planned outages can be deferred or pushed off into uh, a future period or brought forward um, while there's sufficient capacity, that will certainly help. We actually ran a test case of the simulations that showed if you were able to defer planned maintenance out of uh, uh, the period before these new resources come online, that's approximately equivalent to 60 megawatts of that demand response or storage. So it's certainly a, a significant improvement just by changing the way the maintenance schedule is adjusted. Uh, certainly, you know, we looked at specifically the, the large scale utilities, uh, utility scale solar plus storage and standalone storage for this analysis, because that's going to be the big significant changes over the next couple of years. But accelerated deployment of demand response and behind the meter storage, certainly uh, something that could be done in the meantime to support. And then lastly, um, you know, depending on the timing of delays, if this is deemed to be a very short term phenomenon as, as these new resources come online, you know, it is very possible to just live with increased risk during during this transition period. If it does come down to just a few weeks or a month, you know, again, we're looking at this stochastically across many, many years of operation and the likelihood that you get multiple generators going on outage at the same time and potentially a low solar period. So, um, again, if we're looking at just a month or two and, and load tends to be lower in those fall months, then you know, potentially living with an increased risk. Um, could be sufficient to, to act in a transition plan. And again, there's ways to make capacity shortfall events uh, not as disruptive. So again, targeting non-critical loads and, and you can roll those across the system so that they're you know, a matter of 15, 20 minutes in duration um, for any individual customer. So again, an option, certainly not one that people necessarily want, but if it is a short-term phenomenon, one that, that could be reasonable. So with that, um, that's the end of this presentation. Again, we'll, uh, this is available, but will also be available for any comments or, or feedback. So thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, we're gonna go, yeah, we'll save the question and answer period until the end discussion. So uh, we can, uh, so thanks, Derek. Thanks, Rick, for the HNEI uh, presentation. Let's transition to the Hawaiian Electric team. I believe, Jim, you're leading off. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, this Thank is you. Jim Alberts with Hawaiian Electric, and I'm gonna provide some introductory comments, starting with our key takeaways. Uh, just a couple of quick notes, though. We'll have several presenters today covering these high-level topics, but we've also got some of our key subject matter experts available on the call today if questions come up later in the, in the meeting. We're gonna cover the topics that were identified in the commission's December 10th letter, but they may not be in that order. So we will get to all of those questions. And as we start out with this context, I just wanna wish everybody on this call today and, and anybody that's listening a lot of health and safety as we go forward in the world. So uh, with that, we'll jump right into it. So for our key takeaways, now these are just high level summary comments. We wanna put these right up front so we can be thinking about these as we hear the presentations with the detailed information a little bit later. So our first bullet there is, there's no need to extend the AES uh, coal Hawaii PPA when it expires in September. Keeping the plant online is not in our plans. Even with the stage one and two projects online, there's sufficient capacity following the AES shutdown until mid 2023. And you'll see that uh, clearly as Bob Eisler a little later presents his information about our power supply system. 
And in this third bullet, uh, I did want to draw your attention to, uh, I made a typo that we'll correct in a filing, but we stated the, the comment about the stage two PV and storage projects. We're displaying the corrected version here, but in the filed copy, it says stage two, it should have said stage one. So there, there's no current interconnection issues for the projects with the 2022 GCODs. So with those projects coming online, along with the Coppola energy storage system, uh, really increases the likelihood that we won't have any issues. And I think in the, the slides Derek presented earlier uh, showed that clearly, as well as the slides you'll see from us. And then regarding grid services, we're going to talk to you about a grid services RFP as one of our additional options and other things that are being developed as part of our contingency plan. We're also fixing the interconnection issues. We're working closely with developers so that the stage two projects with the 2023 GCODs are not delayed. And you'll see that in, when we look at the schedules uh, for all the projects, uh, there's a category, as an example, there's a category called early engineering. And that just means we get to drive time out of the schedule, working closely with the developers of the projects to take care of long lead items right up front and not see those delays. So there are many things like that. Uh, we're working on with partnership with our developers. We're working hand in hand to bring these projects in on schedule. And lastly, uh, the proposed Coppola energy storage system is a critical and cost effective part of the transition. And it's expected to be online by July 1, 2022. And we meet on this one regularly. Uh, everything we know today says that's true. So we're, we're right on target with all the activities that are going on with that project. And with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Bob Eisler. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I really um, enjoyed the Telos presentation. It's really interesting. It reminds me a lot of what our planners are doing and, and looking at hourly things. And um, it, it's a good way to look at things. What I'm going to present to you is um, going to have a lot of similarities, but um, in a much simpler way that someone operating the power plants in the system can understand on a daily basis. So I want to go over with you guys um, our maintenance schedules for 2022 and 2023. But before I do that, let me explain this chart since everybody's not used to looking at it. Um, on the vertical axis, we have megawatts. And what that represents is a reserve margin. It, 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 it re the line represents the amount of generation that we have available that doesn't have to be running um, and still being able to cover loss of the largest unit on the system when we're running. So you can see the formulas up there. Um, so we have that maroon line, and then in September when AES goes away, that maroon line drops um, to cover that. And so the idea here is that um, we fill in the, the, these colored boxes, which represent unit planned outages. The height of the box represents the amount of megawatts we're taking out, and the width of the box represents for how long we're planning to take it out. And so we fill up these boxes in here and hopefully we have some white space in between the colored boxes and the maroon line because that represents um, our ability to withstand unplanned outages, forced outages on the system. So you could look at it as like a probability. So the more white space, the more um, comfortable we are. So we had put together our 2022 and 2023 schedules because we planned five years out. Um, and we put it together and we said, this was back in the early spring. We said, look, you know, we know that these, ba these battery projects that are all coming on are really important for replacement AES, but what happens if they're delayed or if they don't happen? Um, and, and really concentrating more on delayed. So what we did back in the spring is we adjusted our 2022 maintenance schedule. You can see that September and October don't have any planned maintenance, and we have very little in November and December. We're kind of treating this as if AES is on planned outage for four months because we take AES out every so often to do maintenance. And what that's done is given us some margin in case these projects are delayed. 
So from a comfort standpoint, if we look to the end of 2022, if no new projects come in that can bump that maroon curve up, we feel relatively comfortable with this maintenance mm -hmm. schedule. Um, the 2023 schedule, we didn't adjust. We, we created that with the assumption that we would have replacement projects in for AES. Um, and so if you look at it in the first six months of 2023, we have some areas where we're right up against that maroon curve. Um, that, that's not acceptable. We can't mm -hmm. do that. Now, that said, one of the tools we still have in our pocket is to adjust the maintenance schedules in the first half of 2023 to help us out if projects are delayed uh, past that. Um, it's not it's not preferred. I mean, we'd certainly much prefer all these projects to come in that are scheduled, but if they don't, we have some leeway there. Um, so through the end of 2022, we're pretty comfortable. First half of 2023, um, less comfort, but we think we have some tools in our toolbox to be able to handle that. The second half of 2023 is where it becomes very problematic. Um, we do not have the flexibility in our maintenance schedule to adjust things um, to give us the comfort level that we'll need um, and the margins that we'll need. So, you know, we, we need to do everything we can do to try to bump up this maroon curve. <clears throat> now, we have, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, go up one. Yeah. So the blue curve represents how the maroon curve would change with the um, 135 megawatt standalone storage project that's scheduled. What you will notice is that I didn't put it in until September, even though that project is scheduled to go in the 1st of July. Um, I mean, we have pretty good confidence that it, it will be somewhere around that July date. It, that's a project that has all the ingredients that, um, that a project needs to kind of continue to go along on time. And so we feel pretty good about that. But I just showed it in September, just in case. Um, the, the idea here is to show that if we get that project in, um, I feel comfortable the first half of 2023. I even feel pretty comfortable the second half of 2023. You know, Tello showed that we need a little bit more than that, and that would be highly desired. But if we don't get any more than that, I still feel comfortable moving forward. There's a fair amount of, um, as I put it, white space in between the colored boxes and the line. If you can go to the next slide. So, you know, what if that battery project doesn't come in at all? Well, there are three other stage one projects that are scheduled to come in in 2022. And, and they're scheduled to come in anywhere from July till December. I went ahead and just lumped them all in at the end of December to show um, how that would affect things. And let me explain the dotted line versus the solid line. The dotted line is the nameplate capacity of those projects. The solid line represents what I'm saying is on a really bad day of sun, since those projects can only be, uh, the batteries can only be charged from their associated PV system. Um, that's what we could count on even on a really bad day of sun. So they do help, they help a lot. Um, in this situation, in the first half of 2023, I'd still be a little uncomfortable. I'd still use that tool to readjust the maintenance schedules a little bit, um, but that gives us even more comfort for uh, the first half of 2023. Um, still doesn't do it on its own uh, for the second half of 2023. So, you know, that shows where we are. We, we can handle some delays, that's good, but um, how do we get more comfort? How do we take that maroon line and make it even higher. Uh, so that's where we're looking at other things like uh, the grid services RFP that we plan to go out with that Shelly will talk a little bit. That would help um, if, thing, if that could bring in some assets, say by the end of 2022. Um, you know, the other thing that we are looking at is trying to, how do I put this, minimize, maybe not the number of forced outages, but the length that forced outages might be if we have them. In other words, um, buying some spare parts for, for things that more routinely fail and might have longer lead times, make sure that we have some of those uh, in, in our back pocket. Um, you know, we don't want to go hog wild on that, but have some things. Um, we've also looked at 
other things that Telos had on their slide, or we will continue to look at those. Um, they talked about bringing in generators. One thing we did in the past, uh, you know, about 15 years ago, is we put in some what we called substation DG, which are small um, diesel generator additions at our substations that we can do with minimal permitting and bring them in. Um, I, I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, we already have seven megawatts of grid services uh, approved by the commission that we're working on. We got 20 megawatts in front of the commission for approval. Um, that would help uh, if that goes in. CBRE phase one, about five megawatts. It's not a whole lot, but every little bit helps. You know, so we're looking at all those types of things to try to help us. Um, all, all that said, um, you know, going to back to what I was saying, I think the likelihood of, a, of there being that comfort till mid 2023 is pretty high. Um, from an operator standpoint, the first half of 2023, I'd like to see some things in. Um, it would give me you know, that higher level of assurity that we can provide load. And, and, and before I go off these charts, let me remind everybody that the solid line doesn't re represent the ability to serve the load it represents the ability to serve the load and continue to have a uh, margin that could handle loss of the largest unit. So, you know, if for a day or two or things like that, we poke a little bit over the, the solid line, um, it may not be the end of the world, but we don't want to be there long term. So, like I said, that's kind of a really simple, simpler way to look at it. And it takes into account some timing um, because just because we don't meet planning criteria in a year, doesn't mean we aren't meeting it for part of the year. Um, but our planners, uh, they also did analysis with this uh, maintenance schedule and some of the updated assumptions on timing. And if, if you go to the next slide, they, they kind of um, just confirmed what I said. In, in this scenario too, which is not adding anything, you know, just the maroon line the whole time, you know, they show 281 hours of in 2023 of us not being able to meet our reserve uh, criteria. The, almost all of those 281 hours are in the second half of 2023. Um, there are a few in the first half of 2023 associated with what I showed you where the maintenance schedule bumps up close that we can, we can manage that. Um, so the, like I said, that's just a little bit different way of looking at this. Um, it shows that um, we still need these projects that we're saying we need. Um, but there is a little bit of allowance for some delays if they do get delayed. And I think Jim's gonna talk about things that we're doing to try to limit any delays to those projects. So do I turn it back to you, Jim? Yes, thank you, Bob. All right, this is Jim Alberts again with Hawaiian Electric. Uh, one of the things that, that the commission asked us for in the December 10th letter was an update on all the projects uh, for stage one, stage two, CBRE and grid services. So we've compiled that here. Uh, now, because of time, we're gonna leave some of this to the Q&A period if you have specific questions, but we wanted to make sure we highlighted uh, the projects that Bob talked about as part of his uh, slides. And, you know, those are the AES West Oahu, Mililani One, and the Waiawa Solar Project, along with the uh, Kapolei Energy Storage System, because those are critically important projects. If you think back to the slides Bob had and the value that those provide. So as we noted in our key takeaways, the, uh, those three solar plus PV, solar plus battery projects, uh, we don't see any interconnection issues remaining, so we have high, high probability of those dates coming in. Still staying within Bob's margins, if we get the battery project in and these three projects come in on schedule, uh, that chart starts to look really nice. So this is the most current information we have. Uh, the projects are listed uh, down the left. The steps that are in process, we shown those on these charts and the greens are are color coded if it for example if it's completed it's green if it's in progress light green just to show you the status and where they're at 
Uh, and I commented earlier too, uh, we learned a lot in stage one. In the stage two projects, uh, you'll note the header across the top on the next page. is starts to show a few different things. So if you look out far to the right, like early engineering, you know, we're in discussions with all the developers about how can we speed up that interconnection process, especially where the, you know, the developer has said they're going to build these interconnection ties and then turn them back to us. So if we start that process early, if there are long lead items uh, that need to be ordered for that process, they can get started on it early. And in fact, some of these projects are already showing uh, benefits like the Coppola Energy Storage uh, project at the very top there. We've already demonstrated some time savings in that project for uh, early engineering. Uh, so like I said, we don't wanna go into a lot of detail here because we've got some pretty meaty topics that we need to cover yet, but we're gonna just pause with that and I'll hand it over to Shelly uh, for the update on the grid services, but we wanted to make sure we get everything you need to do a proper assessment here to know where these projects are at and what the best thinking is today on the GCODs with the information we have. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so um, on the grid services RFP that uh, Bob mentioned and Jim mentioned, um, we are expediting plans to issue a phase three RFP in the first quarter of 2021. Um, so this is consistent with uh, the PUC comments and guidance that we've gotten. So appreciate that and, and we're moving forward with that. Um, based on that timing, we would aim to select bidders by the second quarter and execute by the third quarter. Um, we'd target and request a, a quick turnaround um, if possible and to the extent um, available time available for the PUC and then targeting enablement um, second half of 2022 uh, and second half between second half of 2022 and second half of 2023. And then turning it over to the next person. Thanks, Shelly. That's me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Colton Chang here. Um, wanted to cover uh, a few additional topics uh, uh, on this transition from uh, AES's operation to the projects that are uh, com contributing from stage one and stage two. Uh, and the PUC and its letter had some questions, and so we had to provide some charts uh, to provide some, some color. Um, this chart here uh, shows fossil fuel consumption in millions of BTU. Uh, let me start off with the top <coughs> left chart in blue. Uh, the solid blue line represents uh, fossil fuel consumption over the years 21 through 2025, again in MB MMBTUs. And the solid blue line represents a scenario in which uh, the stage one and stage two projects come online as uh, shown in this earlier slides that Jim covered, as well as the Coppola Energy Storage Project coming in uh, in the middle of 2022. The dotted blue line uh, on that same chart uh, is done just for comparison. It's shown as scenario three uh, that shows what would fossil fuel consumption be, just as a comparison, just so we can see what the difference looks like. Uh, if AES uh, well, was not to uh, terminate uh, in September, not, not that that's our plan, but just to provide a comparison, uh, and we had the stage one and stage two projects uh, coming online in the same timing as what's assumed in the solid blue line. Okay, so you can see a significant reduction in fossil fuel uh, consumption uh, when we have the combination of the retirement of AES, uh, as well as the uh, operations of the stage one and stage two projects. Okay, shifting to the chart on the right with purple lines, uh, similar construct, except looking at different scenarios. Uh, scenario, scenario two, which is represented by the solid purple line, uh, assumes AES's retirement uh, as scheduled, the termination of the contract in September. 
shows uh, fossil fuel consumption uh, with the assumption, again, for this scenario, that we have no stage one uh, or stage two projects, including the Kapolei energy storage uh, grid connected battery. So that solid blue line shows uh, a drop in, in fossil fuel consumption from 2021 through 2025, most notably when AES retires or the, the, the contract terminates in 2022. Uh, but you can see that that reduction is uh, not nearly as steep uh, as the solid blue line on the left. Uh, again, just to provide a comparison, because you have a lot of other things changing over the years 21 to 2025, we have a dash purple line, which represents, just as again, as, as a comparison, um, sort of as a business as usual. AES would, if we did an analysis, if we consumed that, assume that AES were to continue to operate and uh, all of the stage one and stage two projects uh, were not to come online, and we had existing projects uh, in our system, the renewable projects that are already in place, plus our existing fleet of thermal generators. Uh, you can see in the dashed purple line, uh, a, ga a gradual uh, increase generally in, in fossil fuel consumption. It's largely driven uh, by the increase uh, in electricity sales that's uh, in our latest forecast, mostly recovering from uh, the events with uh, COVID and the economic impacts of that. So chart in the bottom right, just simply, just for comparison, has both of the data sets all on one chart. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, another question uh, that uh, the PUC had asked us to cover is uh, how much renewable energy uh, will we be getting um, from these projects? Uh, we thought it would be helpful to put it in the context of the same time frame, 21 through 2025, and show the same scenarios again so that we can see a comparison because uh, the relative differences uh, are helpful and insightful. And then uh, also play, put in their fossil fuel consumption just so that that comparison can, can be made. Uh, so similar um, design, except here the focus should be on the green line the solid green line and pretty much right over it is a dashed green line that represents the renewable energy contributions uh, from the stage one and stage two projects. We tried to isolate out uh, uh, other existing um, projects that we have on our system as well as uh, DER, just so we can see the change over time coming in uh, from uh, these uh, procurements. Um, the solid green line represents the current estimate of when these stage one and stage two projects will come online. And then just for comparison, the solid data line uh, shows uh, what uh, under scenario two, uh, what renewable energy levels we will be getting uh, fr from these systems uh, if they're not added. And then scenarios three and four, again, same scenarios from the previous chart, um, and you can see they're largely on top of the solid lines. Okay, next slide. So another set of questions that the PUC asked, had asked us, or topics that the PUC had asked us to cover, was to show a comparison uh, between the grid services provided by AES uh, versus the grid services provided by the stage one and stage two projects. And the, the real, the, the primary grid services that AES provides today is firm capacity uh, and, and energy. So we have two charts here that shows, um, you know, column chart on the left that shows the, in, in yellow, the capacity contribution from AES uh, and the, in green, uh, the uh, capacity contribution from those stage two projects in which we specifically set requirements from those resources um, to provide firm capacity by either being uh, standalone uh, storage systems or to be uh, paired PV and storage systems that allow a limited amount of, of grid charging and for, for all of those projects to have a robust transmission uh, interconnection. And that's shown by the green uh, sliver in that column on the right so to give you a comparison of the two. Um, the chart on the right 
shows the energy, the energy contributions from AES in yellow, and then over time, the energy contributions, uh, cumulative, I'm not cumulative, but collective uh, from the stage one and stage two Oahu projects. Uh, and you can see that the green columns um, grow over time as the projects come online and we're able to get an annualized contribution from those resources. Uh, and then you see that those green lines don't get quite up to uh, AS's um, column. Uh, and that's because in our stage two RFP, uh, we were not able to procure an award uh, the full amount of, of of energy that we had sought in that RFP process. But that energy is made up um, by other resources in the system, while at the same time still reducing uh, total fossil fuel consumption. Okay, uh, so with that, I uh, want to go on to the next slide, Becca. Uh, this is the same slide that uh, Jim used to to kind of kick us off with the key takeaways. Uh, in the interest of time and to allow more time for questions, uh, I won't restate all of them here, uh, but this might be a good slide to kind of keep keep on uh, on the view um, to facilitate any questions that that folks may have. Uh, so with that, um, I'll turn it back to Jim to see if he has any other final thoughts to add, but if not, then we'll turn it back to uh, the chair and the rest of the commission. No, thank you everybody from the Hawaiian Electric team. Uh, really appreciate the thoughts that you've shared. And with that, we'll turn it back to, to you, Commissioner Griffin, for q and A. I I want to thank, uh, I want to thank everyone who presented. This has been extremely informative. Appreciate all the time and effort that went into it. Um, so uh, thanks to the HNEI team. Thanks to the Hawaiian Electric team. Uh, we're going to go directly to the Q&A. I know we've been going for a little while, but we got, I think, some ground to cover. So uh, in our agenda, we provided time for the Consumer Advocates Office. So the Dean and Marcion, I'm not sure um, who wants to lead your questions and discussion. Um, thank you, Chair Griffin. And, and you know, I, I'd also like to express my um, sorry, just turning on my camera. Um, uh, gratitude for both um, Hawaiian Electric and HNEI for their presentations because I think it did have a lot of good information. Uh, I, I would like to take the opportunity to defer to the commission, uh, the, you know, the commissioners and the staff to ask their questions first, because again, you know, we we, we hold you folks in, in in higher importance than our office. So, if you if you folks would like to go first, you know, we we will uh, certainly defer, and then if there are remaining time at the end, we can follow up with any questions that you folks might not have asked. Come on, Dean. We let you go first out of the same courtesy. It's a, everyone abundance of courtesy. Um, Okay, well, we'll continue then and uh, we'll start with commission staff. Dave? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, ha I just had a couple questions. Um, wondering about the stage one projects and their, um, you know, the proposed delays there. Is there any possibility that the in-service dates for those projects could be restored to the original schedule or be accelerated from the current timelines that, that you folks had shared? Hi, Dave, this is Jim Alberts. I mean, we really thought hard about this and the GCOD dates that we put into this update are the best available dates. Now we're gonna do everything we can to try and pull those in if possible, but we have to work closely with our partners, uh, the developers to do this. So the dates you see on the update here, we feel are the best available dates. And if there's anybody else on the team that's on the phone that has another insight that wants to share on that, uh, please jump in. Hey, Dave, this is Colton. Um, maybe to add to, to what Jim mentioned, uh, as these stage one projects transition over to where the bulk of the, the work really is an execution on the part of the developer, 
um, you know, we continue to work with these developers. Um, you know, our approach to this is to meet regularly with them, even though the, it can, covers the work that they are doing uh, and to offer assistance uh, uh, where we can to help uh, get their projects moving along. Uh, a lot of it has discussion has occurred around um, supporting procurement of long lead items, uh, mostly focused around the interconnection facilities, since that's where we have perhaps the most ability to contribute. Uh, but the project teams, as Jim mentioned earlier, do meet very regularly. Uh, and our commitment is to, um, as part of those discussions, not just to track where they're going, uh, but to see where there are opportunities for us to, to assist them with their schedule. Now, even though this is Jim again, Dave, even though you didn't ask this, uh, many of the developers in stage two are the same developers from stage one. So we're, we're learning a lot together. And as the developers build more history here working in Hawaii, that helps also with scheduling. So as you see those improvements that are at the top of the chart for the stage two projects, the different stages that have been put in place, uh, we expect those to, uh, to help. All right, back to you. Okay, th thanks. Um, I guess another question I had was um, about the maintenance schedule. Um, I, so this may be it for Bob or, or someone from your team, Bob, but I'm just wondering if, if it's possible to accelerate some of the maintenance that's scheduled for 2023 um, into 2022, if that is possible or if that would help with you know the squeeze that that looks like is going to happen um, in 2023. Um, yeah, it, if someone can pop up one of the slides that shows the maintenance schedule, it would help to speak to that. Yeah, so you know typically our, our maintenance schedules are pretty full, um, and you know a lot of this is based on timing and things like that. I think. Um, you know, one of the things where you say, I, "I'm," let me just start off by just being frank and saying, I think that would be very challenging for us to do. Um, but one thing, if you look at the while five one, that's in November, December, January, February, you know, that's one of the ideas that if we knew some things were coming in uh, to help push up the maroon curve, we might be able to slide that over to the left to to help with the problem that we would have in February with the KPLP outage and some other things. Um, but it's, it, that's a pretty crammed, cramped schedule that we have in the first, you know, nine months of 2022. Um, so it's hard to bring other things in because, you know, limited work crews, um, things like that. We know, I, I guarantee you, we're going to have forced outages. I don't know what they are, but we'll be working on those. And so, um, that, that would be, that would be a lot for us to bring on, you know, to take a whole unit like k6 and put it on top of that and then i think we'd be um you know affecting our reliability in that first half of 2022 and then you know beck or jim would have to speak to the ipps like kplp but i think you know moving them is like moving mountains sometimes something we'll take a look at um but i i'm not overly positive that we'll be able to do a lot there just being frank with you Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, and then I guess just one other question. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to square the results that we saw from Derek's analysis showing, you know, significant decline in reliability um, when AES is retired and, you know, until there are, um, you know, resources brought in line to help um, replace with. The slide, one of the slides, um, uh, I forget who was, but well, it might have been you, Bob, that was going through the analysis from Juan Electric that showed, um, you know, no, I guess, no, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it, but just no reliability impact in 2022 um, and sort of minimal impact in 2023. I, have you guys, I mean, what's your take? 
on sort of the difference there between you know what what Derek had showed and, and sort of your internal analysis about the, the reliability impact. Let, let me take a let me take a shot at that first, and then let Derek answer that. But one of the things that Telos did in their analysis is they assumed a generic maintenance schedule uh, over the years, and you know the whole outage schedule. I don't think that they were privy to the fact that we adjusted our maintenance schedule at the end of 2022. So I think that that you know shows a big difference. I think that their analysis would probably show that we're a lot better off till the end of 2022. But in 2023, theirs would still show a problem if those things don't go in because of you know the log jam that we have there at the second half of 2023. But I'll let others speak to that now too. Yeah. This is Derek, uh, Bob, I think you are right about that. We didn't uh, use a specific planned outage rate that you're showing here, or planned outage schedule that you're showing here. So that's one piece of it. I would say the other is, you know, this maroon line is assuming uh, the loss of the largest unit. Um, so it's 180 until AES retired, and then it's 142 megawatts. So it's showing you the, the, the space there between um, kind of what's on planned outage and assuming one additional unit or the largest unit is on a forced outage. So I think what the, the other difference in our analysis is looking at probabilistically, you know, what happens if there's two units that go on forced outage or some sort of unplanned maintenance um, or what happens if there's three. And th that's a rare event that you could, you know, you get these overlapping outages, but that's that's specifically what the probabilis probabilistic analysis is doing, is saying there are gonna be times when you get two units on forced outage at a time. And if that, especially like you're showing in the 2023 timeframe, if you had another unit go on outage, I would shift the, uh, the red line down further. Um, and so that I think that's the difference is this is showing Kind of worst case scenario, one unit goes on outage. Our analysis probabilistically, you know, there's going to be some times where there's overlap, and 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 with the the different plan outages that you pointed out. Yeah, and this is Colton Dave. Just to add on top of what Bob and and Derek said. So as planners, sometimes we tend to forget to make this point. Uh, but the uh, uh, analysis that that Derek uh, and the Telos team uh, uh, presented as well as what we show on slide six, which shows our energy reserve margin calculations. Those are calculations, analysis, modeling that demonstrates uh, or determines whether you are hitting a certain level of reliability. So by not hitting, say, our energy reserve margin criteria, or in the case of Derek's presentation, uh, having reliability be above or below what we are currently experiencing, that doesn't necessarily translate into an outage. Uh, whereas what Bob is showing here on, on these maintenance outage slides uh, is a much more granular, direct um, peek at, or look at generation capacity to see if you can actually serve the forecasted load at that period of time. Uh, this is not a criteria analysis that he's showing here, but really or not whether or not you can actually serve load. And there you know, are many instances in which you could be in violation of, say, a planning criteria or a certain reliability target, uh, but not be experiencing uh, an outage because of generation uh, uh, shortfalls, right? And, and that's why we set criteria the way it is. You don't want to set the criteria right at the point in which you're experiencing an outage. So that's another factor to, to take into account as well. And then just lastly, uh, Derek uh, mentioned it in his, uh, in his presentation, uh, but the Telos and HNAI team uh, have, have been, in their analysis, have been using, I think it was a 2020 uh, load and energy forecast that comes from the PSIP. And, uh, you know, a lot has happened um, since the PSIP. And uh, in the charts here, um, Bob is using a, a forecast, uh, a more updated forecast of our future peaks uh, that are uh, a bit lower than what was uh, used for the Telos analysis. That you know gives gives a little bit more conservatism uh, into into uh, uh, Telos's analysis. Um, but I just want to point out that that additional difference as well. Yeah, cool. And th thanks for pointing that out and, and 
and stating that clearly. So yeah, it is using a higher load. Um, so what that means in terms of the trends that were that we showed, really no difference. If we were to increase the, the or decrease yeah. the load, the overall trend, the relationship between the different scenarios would be the same. But you are right, Colton. That would the absolute reliability level would be different. Um, the other thing is, you know, we were looking at what it takes to get back to the current level of reliability to the extent that there's some margin, bit, you know, already in the current system. That, that would translate to additional margin here as well. Uh, we intentionally normalize that to the current level just because, uh, as to Bob's point, depending on which planned outage schedule we picked, that could really swing around the reliability metrics and the reliability criteria. Again, we are focused on those trends as you move from one scenario to the next and not necessarily the absolute um, risk levels. Okay, thanks for that. Um, everybody, I, I guess the last question I had was um, for now uh, was, it, has there been any thought to utilizing the existing um, DER fleet, the resources from all the um, PV and storage that, that has been installed over the last few years to help um, as perhaps as an alternative to you know, trying to do another um, RFP or, or, you know, big solicitation for grid services. Uh, Dave, I might need some clarification on, on what your intention is there, but um, so that those systems that are already online, they could participate in an RFP. Um, in the DER docket, you know, we recently just this past week talked about uh, programmatic options. And so we are going down that path. As you guys saw, there may be some um, challenges with the current fleets and what communications uh, are available. Uh, but if you have something more specific, maybe I can respond more specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, tie, you know, ties to the discussions that have been happening, you know, I think, but I think that the need seems to be, um, well, depending on Sort of what analysis you're looking at, you know, the need may be, um, you know, somewhat sooner than than the the time frame that was described in the slides you showed, um, and so I'm just thinking, you know, maybe there's a way to, um, you know, utilize some of the existing resources that are already in, you know, perhaps programmatically. Um, so um, it sounds like it's something that is being considered um, as part of the DER docket. Yeah. And both ways, DER docket and this procurement that um, we're working on designing, which may take some of that into consideration as well. So we're still working through the design of it. Okay, I'll, um, thanks, Shelly. I'll, uh, Chair Griffin, I'll, I'll hold the rest of my questions uh, for later if there's time. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, next to our Chief Counsel, Carolina Sheeta has a couple of questions. Thanks, Jay. Um, our chief engineer had to drop off of the WebEx, so I'm asking these questions on her behalf. Um, the first one is on slide six of HECO's presentation. She was wondering how the energy reserve margin percentage was calculated. Hi, Caroline. This is Colton here. Uh, I'll take a swing and uh, I'll ask uh, Mark Asano and Robert Ulyanton to jump in if uh, if I don't get it complete. Um, but the energy reserve margin is a, a new methodology and criteria that we developed uh, at Hawaiian Electric to really kind of advance uh, the, the manner and, and basis for which we determine resource uh, uh, adequacy for, re for, re for reliability. So just a bit of ba background, our Current methodologies uh, are mixed. On Oahu, we have a deterministic uh, using something called rule one and rule two. Uh, and then we also have a reliability guideline, which is a probabilistic approach, uh, but it's only looking at the probability of our ability to serve our, our peak load. And uh, because it's only looking at a single point in time and the way our methodology uh, is structured, we. None of our uh, previous methodologies 
could really accurately capture the reliability contribution uh, from energy uh, limited resources uh, or time limited resources like batteries, like demand response, uh, as well as variable resources like solar and wind. And so we moved to this new methodology, uh, something we started working on last year. Uh, we have had several discussions with the IGP TAP on this. Uh, I think we presented at the Solution Evaluation Optimization Working Group this past summer, I believe it was in May. Uh, but essentially what the energy reserve margin uh, criteria does, it looks at uh, the uh, adequacy of generation, taking into account firm resources and the maintenance schedules associated with them. We take into account the shifting uh, of, of load from energy storage devices. Uh, we look at uh, interruptible loads, i.e. demand response and ability to shape loads uh, at either specific times or on command. And then we look at uh, probabilistically, statistically, the contributions of, of solar uh, wind resources as well as res wind resources to come up with a uh, determination for every single hour of every year that we analyze of the amount of generation that's available to serve the load in that hour. And then we add on top of that a reserve margin. Uh, for Oahu, we use a reserve margin of 30% uh, to account for what's not included uh, within our ERM calculation in terms of uncertainty, right? So there's uncertainty of load, you know, is our forecast for the load for that hour spot on, it may be off. So it accounts, that reserve margin accounts for variability in that. Uh, it accounts for, uh, you know, uh, uh, Derek spoke about this earlier, it accounts for uh, unscheduled outages, whether it's a maintenance outage or a forced outage rate of a firm generating unit. Uh, and it also accounts to a, to a lesser extent, the uh, remaining uncertainty of variable generation uh, performance in that hour. Uh, but it really looks at using a production simulation. So the, the, the methodology really relies on the use of our Plexos model to use a production system capability to look at the specific state of charge of that battery in that hour, the dispatch of firm generation, what's available, what's not available. The solar resource, again, on a statistical basis of what amount of solar and what so amount of wind can actually contribute uh, to capacity to serve load in that hour. And then we, we make that per, uh, percentage calculation. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's kind of it. There's way more detail that you know, Robert and uh, Mark can get into, but sort of in a nutshell, that's that's what we do. And we do it, again, we do it for every hour. This slide here provides a summary. So we're showing annualized uh, values um, and we're showing in the, in the bottom left chart, what is the minimum reserve margin that we calculated, but again, for the year. But th again, we do this calculation for every every single hour of the year. Mark or Robert, anything that I missed? Uh, no, Kilten, I think you covered it. Okay. I just have one more question, uh, which was, it was related to slide 10. And I know Shelley had said that the Phase three Oahu grid service RFP is sort of still in the works, but the question is just how many megawatts of grid services are expected to be procured in this? Um... Yeah, so right now, you know, in discussions with our planning and ops folks, um, and consistent with what you folks saw from um, HNEI today, we're looking at 50 to 60 megawatts. Okay, great, thank you. And Chair, those are the only questions I had. Great, thanks, Caroline. Uh, I believe Commissioner Sunsian has a few clarification questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, this one is for HNEI. Derek, um, just want to <clears throat> confirm or clarify for me on slide 12, on your slide 12, so second to the last. Uh, we talk about 
Um, actually, not on this slide. It's probably earlier, but it goes towards these key findings. Uh, there was a, a mention of um, like a modest amount of solar storage in addition to uh, the standalone 135 megawatts uh, from Kapolei. Uh, can you give me an idea on what modest is? And that, is that relating to what uh, Shelly just answered, the 50 to 60 megawatts? I could also take a crack. This is Rick at that sure. question, so. if it's okay. If, if you refer back to slide 11, it, it shows that if the storage, the 135 megawatt of capacity storage is in, mm -hmm. um, somewhere substantially below 50 megawatts of solar plus storage re restores the system to the reliability level that is currently modeled in the system with AES operational. So. It was to say that even even if the the amount of solar was was substantially below that expectation of September 2022, that battery plus a very small amount of solar would restore that curve to that current value. That's a calculated value, but calculated all on a as as Derek him stated, all done on a consistent basis. Yep. Thanks, Rick. I, and I apologize for the pause that I wasn't uh, exactly sure that was directed to me. And so likewise on the CBRE solar plus storage, the, uh, the grid services that are, you know, the capacity grid services that are going in, that would also help as incremental capacity. So certainly we looked at the large scale utility scale resources because those are the big, big changes. But when you get into some of the, you know, I think as Bob said, every little bit counts, especially um, if it is in a short period of time, so. Okay. Then uh, my only other question for you folks is on slide 13. Uh, we talk about these options that are here. I just want to make sure that I understand. So the options developed here uh, really just focus on the reliability question and it doesn't look at like what it might cost or how much time it might take to go through the process of implementing any of these options? Correct, yeah, we didn't try to rank them or come up with time, although I believe in terms of the timing, uh, all of these are something that could be done in, you know, in the time frame we're talking about the next couple of years. Um, obviously, Excel, accelerate deployment of demand response and behind the meter storage, that would take some time, but certainly you could make the incremental um, improvement in, in some amount of time over the next couple of years. But I think all the other ones uh, are viable from a timing perspective, but we didn't try to rank them in terms of cost. Okay, thanks. This my question is for Hiko. Um, maybe I missed it, uh, but on slide five, Bob. On your book, slide five, sorry. Uh, what was the dotted green line again? Right, so we have the solid green line, which is the addition, but what is the dotted? Yeah, so the dotted green line represents the name plate capacity of the three projects planned for 2022, the 87.5 megawatts. The okay. That's the dotted line. The solid line represents what uh, I feel comfortable from a maintenance planning standpoint of assuming is like a worst case. This is what we'd get from them on a in, on a day with bad sun. Okay. So so typically they would be at the dotted line, but there are going to be days when they're at the green solid green line. Yeah. Okay. And um, you can tell me if I'm not relevant or relevant. Uh, right, so we saw these slides, uh, right, starting with uh, the maroon line that's there, then what would happen if we add, right, couple A on 135 megawatts, and then separately, if we write these uh, uh, 87.5 megawatt, would it, 
would the total picture be a combination of all of these? Yes and no. Let me let me cover the yes part. Okay. Um, if you if you're adding the blue line and the green line, the answer is yes. Up to about 200 megawatts, the answer is yes. Um, after about 200 megawatts, you start getting um, less of a, a one for one equivalence um, because yeah. four hour storage just doesn't cover that part of the peak that you're trying to shave anymore. It's a wider part of the peak. But ultimately, it does continue to add. It just may not be a one for one. And okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A um, couple more questions. Uh, Jim, I think this was you on slide nine. And again, forgive me if I if I missed it. So these, um, so for Oahu project two and three under the CBRE, is there any um, estimate on when we're gonna get to like contracts and then also construction? Uh, Jim, I can jump in. Okay. So for Oahu project two on the contract, um, we have a joint target with the developer to get that signed by the end of the year. So that one's on a really good track. Um, okay. Oahu Project 3, um, they're in the same stage right now, but the the visibility to how quickly we'll be able to sign a contract is not as clear right now. We're still working with them. Okay, and then for like the construction box, show you. Um, I'm assuming yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm assuming right after you go, right after you get a contract and agreement, it doesn't start the next day, right? There's still some mm -hmm. some time, like if they need to get permitting. Yes, yeah, so ask Mark if he can speak to that um, based on our, our experience so far with other developers. So, um, Guang, so just looking for the period of time before between signing and starting of construction? Um, yeah, it would be several months uh, for engineering and procurement to occur before uh, actual construction works. And uh, we are still uh, working on the schedules uh, with the developer to um, develop a timeline for that. Okay. And this is my last question. Uh, this is a slide that Colton, you covered, slide 12. Um, maybe it's my eyes and maybe it's time, but you know, these, these things, uh, what's the one I think was, sure, looking at the right one. Yeah, slide 12. Okay, so actually I'll withdraw it because now I see there's there's an update because uh, yeah the slide deck I, I had like scenario I, four looked I, the same. Uh, yeah I apologize commissioner I was so nervous as I was going through my slides I forgot to mention probably the most important thing uh, that we had caught an error in the version of the slides that we had submitted uh, so along with the other change that uh, Jim, Jim Alberts mentioned on our uh, key takeaways uh, we'll include this this update. I I, I okay. apologize. I, I missed it. No, because I, I was looking at the one we got sent then. But I'm like, is it my eyes or am I missing something so my you if you turn it, if you turn it if you turn it sideways, it kind of looked the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um Lee, that's all the questions I have. I yield back to you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Sunshine. Uh Commissioner Potter. Thank you. I have no questions. Everyone's covered them so far. So thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have a few questions. And, and really, it starts at the highest level because I'm I'm trying to resolve. I feel like some some level we've heard two different diverging stories here. And if I look at um, Derek's slide, I think it's number nine. Right. This was the Derek. If you could put this up with the transition. This was the first curve you showed where the AES retirement, um, yeah, with no additional projects. I mean, this is where we stand today, right? None of these projects are online. And so 
that what you're saying without anything, or even if they're further delayed, there's a 17 uh, time increase in risk. Now we heard that's not a guarantee of an outage, but that's 17 times over the current reliability of the system. And I just, I would also ask what's kind of the industry norm here? Yes, uh, industry norm. So again, this this normalized LOD, we're not showing kind of the the absolute number, um, which would be more of an industry norm. It, that in, in terms of a North American industry norm would be one day in 10 years or 0.1. I believe the HECO reliability criteria is is higher than that because you know you don't on Hawaii have the advantages of um, importing from a neighboring power system or things like that. So the AES retirement, like with nothing replacement, replacing would be significantly higher than the kind of the heat reliability criteria. Um, where is, but is it fair to say is, that it would be uh, nowhere is it near 17 in North America? Sorry, this is 17 times the current system. Oh, sorry. So this is, is the, yeah, yeah. This is there kind would be of nowhere that you've you've operated that this would be acceptable. That would be correct from a stochastic perspective. Okay, so I, I just want us to like let's be clear with ourselves. That's you know, to me, this is what keeps me up at night. You know, seeing this graph. Um, and then, you know, the good news is what, you know, you've seen as we progress with projects. And I guess I just, I wanna ask, I think this is best asked to Bob and maybe Colton. I mean, I, we, we, saw your, we saw the slides stepping through, we're looking at the reserve and capacity um, calculation. And I get the difference, or I guess, you know, we're partly talking in two different languages. One is loss of load expectation um you know this is a, it's a probabilistic estimate you know if if the unplanned happens you know that's the risk that you carry and right it, what i think we saw in Hawaiian electric's plan is you you've you stepped through your plan maintenance looking at adjustments and what we know today but i think you know this is the kind of fundamental of power system reliability you you have to know expect that the unplanned happened we just dealt with this two months ago on Kauai where three additional units went on outage on top of one that was on planned maintenance. Um, and so I, I bring it up because I, I feel like that there's a disconnect between the additional risk and what we saw in the, the graphs showing um, that things were okay, that the pieces of the transition are coming into place. So I just, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, that, misunderstatement or a misunderstanding or mischaracterization, right? Am I un, is, is my concern not warranted? Yeah, let me, let me try to address that first. So, um, and, and maybe I didn't do a good enough job of this, but uh, like I said, through the end of 2022, I feel com very comfortable, I feel confident. And I think that the analysis that Telos did if if they just looked at 2022 with this maintenance schedule, you wouldn't see it being 17 times higher. I think you'd see it being closer to what it is today. Um, the first half of 2023, um, I would characterize that as I'm I'm sweating. Okay, uh, I'm not super comfortable, but there are tools that we can use to try to manage the situation. Um, I, it's not that I'm super happy. I want projects, I want things to come in to bump that curve up before 2023. But the second half of 2023, I'm panicking. <laughs> I mean, I maybe I'm, you know, that that just is not acceptable. That's not going to work. There's nothing that we can do to manage that type of situation. And that's more of what you're looking at, I think, in the Telos thing as the 17 times as bad. I, I don't know if that helped. But remember, TELUS is looking at the whole period. They're not looking at different portions of the year, right? Okay. Can I ask, Commissioner, may I ask one question here, clarification? In, in looking at, Bob, in looking at your graphs, your different lines, you always 
Okay, I guess your first maroon line, you have no stage one or stage two projects out. Okay. I'll, right. I'll and, 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 and so I, I did, you know, once again, I want to reiterate, um, I think it, I think we need to do everything we can do to make sure that the projects that are scheduled to come in in 2022 come in on time or soon thereafter. I mean, we can handle some delays and feel more comfortable. Um, I would hate, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't delay any of these till 2023. Um, I also think it's very prudent that we're looking at other options. I, I, I like the fact that we're looking at grid services. Um, I, some of the other things that we talked about, like bringing in um, either diesel generators to our substations or even leasing batteries for a period of time, um, those are things that we don't have to pull the trigger on now, but we'll continue monitoring this. And you know, if we have to pull the trigger on it at some point um, to get there, we can. Um, because the first half of 2023 is, it's not, it, it's a balance of you know, when I talk to you trying to say that, you know, I'm super nervous and there are things that we can manage to some extent we can manage it, but I would feel much, much more comfortable if there were things to push up that curve, the, the, the maroon line. Okay, that's helpful. Sure. Um, I just one. Oh, sorry. Was there another comment? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, Chair. I'll be. I'll be really quick. This is. This is Colton and Becca. If you can, thank you. Just go to six. Just to provide one connection. <clears throat> uh, Bob kind of covered this very, very quickly. But if I can ask folks to kind of focus on scenario two, which is uh, AS retires in September and no stage one and stage two projects come online. Uh, you see in our ERM calculations that uh, in 2022, we're actually okay, mostly because in our calculations, when AES goes offline, we're experiencing significantly lower loads um, you know, each day and in those months following it. So we typically experience our peak um, you know, August, September, and, and beyond that, the loads are lower. But then you can see in the year 2023, right? we have 281 days uh, in which we do not meet our ERM criteria. And I think that ties uh, largely to, although we're approaching it with different methodologies, I think it generally ties uh, to the chart uh, that Derek presented. Uh, what Bob mentioned when he covered this slide is that when you look at the 281 days, um, the days in which we have uh, our ERM being violated, where we're less than 30%, largely come in the the second half of 2023 and it's because of the specific maintenance schedule uh, we're, we're using and because of the lower loads that we experience uh, and are forecasting for those, for, those, for those earlier days of the year. So I just want to make that one connection. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, actually, I'm Colton, is it, yeah. is it number of days or hours? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Number of hours. But you're, I mean, the criteria is that, or, I mean, if you look at scenario one, or the, you're shooting for zero, right? So the fact that you have hundreds is, again. A failure of that criteria, yes. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's the circumstance where we all get fired. <laughs> where, you know, we're at unacceptable levels of reliability, right? Yeah, and those are the second, that represents the second half of 2023. And that's why, you know, it's urgent that we move on these things and make sure we get things installed before uh, the middle of 2023 at, at the very latest and ideally when they're scheduled. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second because that's a very good point. Uh, Derek, you had, I just had one, yeah, clarification. Bob said that if you'd had the updated maintenance schedule that would uh, largely take care of the higher risk is that I think you'd had a scenario where you looked at adjusting the maintenance schedule and it, it definitely helped, but did not necessarily take care of it all by itself. That is what I mean. Yeah, it certainly helps. Um, I don't know if, yeah, I think that's right. It, it helps quite a bit. I don't know if it would um, mitigate it altogether. So just to give you a sense, we only ran, we ran a test case where we just took the, you know, the example of that sub, September to October period where there's no planned outage or no planned maintenance. Um, 
And we, t- we just took that and said, well, what if we ran, re-ran the analysis with no, uh, no band outages at all? And so that, and we ran on one case, kind of the, the 100 megawatts of PV plus storage coming in. So a partial build out of stage one and no maintenance. That brings, um, even without the standalone storage, that brings us right to this about this purple dot. You know, we debated whether we should put it on or be almost exactly overlapped here. So essentially, with a partial build out of stage one and no plan maintenance, uh, it would get you right about close to the current levels of reliability. Um, so it would help, but again, that's with some of the solar plus storage resources coming in. Okay, all right, that's, uh, I wanted to follow up on the timing question because I feel like what it's encouraging, there's additional contingency options. What I haven't really heard is anything to address the contingency if the schedules on all these projects get pushed back and not to the fault of anyone here. There's a lot of reasons why commission approves things on time, why electric does its job, projects can still be delayed. So what, I mean, what are the other contingency options why electric's considering if we do encounter further delays of stage one projects and the couple a project if that was to be approved because again we end up in that zone where there's not a lot of new resources there to replace the existing plant it may it may only be temporary it may be six months it may be a year but again we're way above that line either from what from understanding right either in colton's Scenario two, that would be one of those years or the risk analysis. So I, I think we need to be thinking in, you know, other options that will help buffer that and other things that will continue to mitigate against that, draw timelines further because, the, right, these are large projects. The timelines generally go, the, they're more likely to go later than earlier. So what, what are we, I, I just want to put collectively what are we doing? Because what's on the table today may still be further delayed. Yeah, from my side, Jay, I mean, Chair, um, we have, we've been looking at that. I mean, w- like in a horrible, horrible situation, what if all these things are delayed past mid-2023, where I'm telling you we, we have the tightness? Um I, I don't know that I have super good answers for you right now, but you know, one thing that we'd have to look at is not doing the maintenance that we have scheduled, pushing it out. That's going to create, you know, that could create longer term problems. We really don't want to do that. We could do that. One other thing that may or may not be on the table is, you know, there are people out there that we can pick up the phone and call and they can fly in generators and temporary switching stations and hook them up. The challenge with doing that is, um, you know, permitting, getting air permits. If if it's a natural disaster like a hurricane or a tsunami that wipes things out and there's a, a emergency declaration, we can, that would certainly be doable, would allow us to get past that. Um, I mean, if it were a normal situation where emergency has not been declared, I, I don't think that's really a viable option. Um, but under the right circumstances, it could be. So those are a couple of things just, you know, that we've been bouncing around and thinking about. But I, I don't have, I, I don't have a good pat answer that says, you know, this is the ideal thing to do. But the first thing we do is just not do the maintenance. Okay, that's, I mean, it- the list on the Tello slide kind of touched on some of these topics. So, right, the contingency planning, you know, covers the range and we gotta be thinking of, you know, things don't go in the favor of of what we're shooting for. I, I just kind of feel like we're, there's a lot of just in time planning here. Um, think bringing things on just in time when, you know, conditions mitigate, you know, kind of push back against that. If I can mention one more thing, um, you know, a brainstorm type idea that we've had is, and we mentioned it briefly, and that's, there are people out there now who will lease 
storage. And the concerns that I had mentioned about permitting uh, don't necessarily exist if we're bringing in storage because there's no emissions from the storage. Um, then it's just a matter of finding the right, you know, finding a property that's big enough that, you know, we can tie into and do things like that. Um, we can try to see if, for example, the Coppola Energy Storage Project, um, you know, has some land. There is some land next to the CEIP sub that we could look to buy um, to put some amount of storage there. Um, we were looking to buy that before. That's about $4 million parcel right next to one of our substations. Those things could be very useful in helping us come up with, can, you know, like down the, down the road contingency efforts that we wouldn't want to pull the trigger on unless we have to. Okay, no, I appreciate that. I think this is much to foster that kind of creativity again, right? Continue. You hope you don't. You hope you don't have to pull the trigger on these things. But um, I guess, Bob, I've got one question for you. Uh, Honolulu eight and nine always gets listed as deactivated but mothballed. I, I know that's probably totally out there, but I mean the asset is there. I don't know if it's in any sh shape to to bring back to service if necessary. But again, I, I think one thing that's important to note is this, we're showing the probability that you would cross over a point where there's enough resources. It could, it would still be a relatively few times a year. Like even in this worst case, you know, AES is retired. We're talking about a handful of days across the entire year on a probabilistic uh, manner. So it's, you know, we're looking about days of a response from something. And then even that would maybe only be a couple hours per day. So, um, you know, whether that's, you know, a generator that we really don't want to use, or if it's, I, you know, with some air permits, I don't know how that works, but there might be, if it's only for a couple of days per year, for a couple hours, there might be a little more leniency there. And then even when you start talking about really large demand response, you know, there's there may be some customers out there large customers that if it's you know at most it'd be two days a year for two hours they might be willing to participate and it, it could be like almost a, a special card out or something but again that's just kind of spitballing ideas yeah i'll, okay. I'll, I'll mention oh okay i didn't know if you wanted me to answer that chair or uh well i want to i know we in in for respect for Dean, I don't want to, uh, in his office, I want to make sure they have some time. I just had a couple more confirmations. I, Shelly, you covered it in your slide, and we've asked that, that in the intention that companies are going to go forward with another grid services solicitation. That's... Yes. Okay. Um, details TBD, but I think we... But quickly, I think we're all talking about but, urgency here. Yeah, for what yeah. we... Uh, okay. Understood. Yeah, we're on the yeah. same page. Chair um, Griffin, this is Jim Alberts. Just yeah. one quick thought, and this isn't big, but it just speaks to some of these things around the edge that could help, since every little bit helps. A uh, program called MEETS, uh, Meter Energy Efficiency Program with a company called Gridium. And I know it started in Seattle, but we've been exploring that here. So we've got a pilot uh, that we're working through. We've got some imputed debt problems we have to resolve on our side. But something small like that could be fairly scalable pretty quickly uh, if needed. But that's something, it's a different alternative, a different way to look at it. But I wanted to let you know about that just from an innovation perspective. I think we're well aware of those discussions being lengthy and extended. So, okay. Uh, I guess, um, no, I think covered the bases for myself. So thanks everyone. And Dean, I want to go to uh, to your office. Um, th thank you, Chair. I, I want to be respectful for everybody's time. So I, I know I'm, I'm just going to focus on a couple of questions, but before I do that, Mark, did you have any burning questions that you wanted to start with? Uh, no, I don't, I think. No, I don't think so. I think a lot of it was covered. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and 
follow up on a question I think Dave originally asked, and then I, I think there was a mention of maybe Becca discussing it. Has has the company have has the company discussed with um the the independent power producers the possibility of changing their schedule? Because when I look at um I think it's Kiko slide three, it looks like the first time there might be a really small margin is uh, actually in February of 2023. Um, and then, you know, if it's possible to get, um, and it looks like KPLP, there's there's this just this really odd peak that kind of contributes to that um, shortage or that, you know, that closing of the margin. Is there any possibility of getting them to, to you know, move some of their maintenance around or just doing something to maybe avoid that that peak? I shouldn't say peak, but. Um... Yeah, um, Dean, we haven't had a conversation with KPLP at, at this time. Typically, they have to bring in contractors from outside to complete their maintenance. So it'll it'll be dependent on how their um, outside contractors can adjust their schedule as well, but definitely something that um, you know, we can do and and try to work with them on. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to ask because I know um, Bob was mentioning you guys have your own resources and you got to kind of live within that. But since it's you know an IPP, arguably if if they're going to bring in their own resources, even you know moving that up into 2022, um, you know to avoid having that that first instance, and then um, you know that that might be something to consider, right? Yep, definitely. Okay, thank you. And then if, if I can, um, I, I think Colton touched on it and um, uh, HNEI's analysis was using uh, an earlier forecast and then you, you folks said you use an updated forecast. Um, did it include the impacts of, you know, what we're, what we're experiencing now under COVID in terms of the impact on load or was that, um, was that forecast still kind of based on pre-COVID impacts? Just trying to get a sense of if, if 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 it didn't consider COVID, arguably your your margin might be a little larger, right? Because everybody's anticipating that the recovery from COVID is going to take a little longer than just a, a year or two, right? Yep. Uh, morning, Dean. This is Colton. Uh, just to confirm that the forecasts that we use in our analysis is is our latest forecast and does okay. include. Um, the forecasted impacts of COVID. Having said that, it's a forecast. Um, you know, and to your point, recovery may end up taking longer than what we had assumed. The sort of the vintage of our COVID forecast uh, comes from this uh, maybe early summer of of this year. So, a lot has changed since then, and so we're continuing to look at how COVID and the recovery impacts our forecast. But that's what we have in our analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, and and two more questions. One is um, just kind of eyeballing things. It, it looks like maybe the biggest bang for buck might come from that um, Kapole battery storage in terms of you know the ability. Because for instance, if we look at um, was it scenario scenario five under your energy reserve margin results on your your slide six. If if I understand what's being proposed there, uh, if the storage goes in, um, and, and I and, and I think there's a little bit of um, maybe a, a small difference because on this slide it's six one twenty twenty two, and I think on an earlier slide um, it's projected to come in at the end of June six twenty nine. But at, at any rate, it seems that if the storage goes in, uh, and then we look at scenario five on the left hand side. Um, the number of hours in terms of, of uh, pass-fail criteria, there's one hour in 2024, but at least 2022 and 2023, um, there, there aren't the same violations that we see, say, in scenario two, right? But uh, So is that a fair assumption? Yeah, sure. you get a lot of reliability contribution in, in our methodology uh, from the, the grid-connected storage, uh, in part because its output it will not be um, reduce on days where um, those stor storage that's reliant on um, a specific uh, solar project, um, you know, you don't doesn't have that effect. We can allow for grid charging, uh, and and it's a pretty big project, 135 megawatts. Sorry, if I can, one follow up question to that: um, 
if if I heard correctly, this was based on that storage not being charged by the grid. Is that correct? No, no, no. Uh, Kapolei Energy Storage is a grid grid connected standalone yeah. battery, so it would be charged from the grid. The the, the distinction okay. there is that because it's not subject to uh, situations where it cannot be may not be fully charged under certain circumstances because it's always able to be charged from the grid. Okay. Uh, it has a slightly greater reliability contribution on a per unit basis. That combined with the fact that it's 135 megawatts uh, for capacity, it gives it a, a significant contribution. So, so sorry, I, I do have another follow-up question. Um, does it make sense to see what we can do to try to make sure we expedite the processing of that application before the commission so that perhaps there's an opportunity to see if it can be put into commercial operation prior to 6.1 or 6.29? Because uh, I know I, if I recall in an earlier presentation, you, you folks had planned for it to come in line sometime in June to give you a couple of months operation before AES retired, does, does it make sense to try to get it in maybe even another month or, you know, uh, whatever might be feasible just to get you guys at um, operating level of comfort with, with the battery storage and making sure that you're ready um, for that, that event, the AES retirement? Yeah, thanks for that, Dean. You know, I think for, for a number of reasons, you know, if there's an ability to get uh, the Kapolei Energy Storage project in service uh, faster, um, you know, that that will make us all happy, uh, I think, for a number of reasons that we talked about today. Um, we've, uh, we touched upon it in one of the earlier slides that uh, Jim covered, but we have have been working very closely with Kapolei Energy Storage, and really we're progressing, we're moving forward, right? I know we don't have PUC approval, a decision on that application yet, uh, but we've begun early engineering uh, with with KES. They're looking on long lead procurement. So at this point, uh, and, and and Becca and Jim jumped in if I don't have it quite right, but my understanding is that the uh, pending application before the commission is not uh, holding back or slowing down the project. Right? We understand the urgency of it. So does KES, uh, and have been, we've been working with them briskly. Uh, on on their project work. Yeah, Colton, I definitely think that's the case that we've been working with them. It's it's moving along. Obviously, you know, that's requiring KES to put a lot of money up front at risk before they have PC approval. And um, so I think anything we can do to you know, expedite PC approval as well would always be helpful and give the developer more comfort as we continue to progress um, and move even further through the steps. Okay, thank you. And and um, for sure, this, I, I promise this is going to be the last question. This might be a little outside of the scope of the presentation because I know we've been looking at capacity and re reserve margins. But do you guys have an any type of high level assessment? You know, when AES is retired and some of these things start to um, come into play, what the potential impact on customer bills might be? Yeah, Dean, um, you know, I can't recall off of the top of my head the, the specifics, um, but I think there was, I believe there was an IR uh, where, where, that was, where that was discussed. Um, you know, I think uh, in the near term uh, with the, the loss of AES, there will be some um, uh, increase in, in customer rates or bills because we no longer have the low cost energy contribution from AES. Uh, but since that analysis was done, you know, COVID has hit us, uh, our peaks are lower, uh, which changes system land and dispatch. And then, you know, equally important, uh, our fuel prices today are significantly below what we had assumed that they were gonna be in 2018 and 2019's forecasts. Um, so that that will help kind of mute uh, that impact. I, I will say when we, um, you know, evaluated the bids most recently in the stage two RFP when we made decisions on which projects to select and put forward. A big part of our evaluation was making sure that the projects that we selected and the portfolio we put forward uh, to award was looked at from an economic basis as well. Yeah. No, 
Fair enough. And and again, I, I appreciate the time chair that you you allowed for uh, those those few questions. And and uh, again, thank you to Hawaiian Electric and H and EI for your very informative uh, presentations. And with that, I you know turn it back to you, Chair Griffin. Okay, uh, I just wanted to offer. Uh, Dave Parsons said he may have some follow up questions. So, one last chance. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, no, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll hold off, and I, I don't think this will be the last time we'll um, be talking about this stuff. So, I'll, um, I'll hold off until the next opportunity. Thanks. Okay, uh, that's a good segue. So, I think uh, appreciate everyone's time um, putting forth the information here. It's been a Excellent discussion. Um, I think it's a lot of aspects are encouraging. I think we still have some more work to do to get the level of comfort that we need. Uh, so we'll be in contact. Uh, thanks everyone for your time today. Uh, echoing Jim, be safe, be healthy, happy holidays. Take care. Aloha. Thank you, Chair. Aloha, Thank you, Rick and Derek. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you.